The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hi, and welcome to OpenBXRX Tuesday, a weekly program providing you the latest information, resources, services, and community efforts taking place locally here in the Bronx and virtually. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, and today is Tuesday, August 24th. Coming up, the 2020 census results revealed that New York City's population hit a record 8.8 million, remaining the largest city in the nation. How did the Bronx contribute to the count? Stay tuned to find out. Then, back to school is normally a time of excitement for adolescents, but the COVID-19 pandemic, remote learning, and the transition to in-person has intensified the stresses of many youth. We'll discuss this and more with our Montefiore expert. After that, we'll learn more about the four new Metro North stations coming to the Bronx neighborhoods of Hunts Point, Park Chester Van Ness, Morris Park, and Co-op City. And We Stay Nos Quedamos invites you to their open health centered on community and healing at Brook Park Community Garden. So please, stick around. Open BXRX Tuesday starts now. Welcome to Open BXRX Tuesday on BronxNet. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, and I'd like to invite you to get social with us at BronxNet TV on Instagram and Twitter and BronxNet Community Television on Facebook. The 2020 census results revealed that New York City's population hit a record 8.8 million, remaining the largest city in the nation with the Bronx contributing 6.3% to that growth. Joining us now to discuss how the Bronx fared this census is Mark Perry, Senior Demographer at the Census Bureau. Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to be here. Nice to have you. Um, so right into it, how was New York and the Bronx's participation in the census overall, Mark? How are we in regards to population this year? Uh, it was very good. It was very good. So nationally, the response rate for the 2020 census was 67%. Uh, New York State was a little bit below that, uh, about 64.2%. And the Bronx was a smidge below that at 62.8%. Thank you for that. And which neighborhoods led to the population growth here in the Bronx in particular? It was really widespread uh, across the Bronx and uh, actually all of New York City. Um, the, uh, there weren't particular areas, uh, that weren't contributing. I mean, it was pretty, uh, moderate growth, um, throughout much of the borough and in fact, throughout much of the city. Got it. I know a huge concern with the census count was the fact that so many people left uh, New York City at the beginning of the year due to COVID-19. Were those who left the state during the pandemic still eligible to be counted by the census? Yes, absolutely. So the, the reference date for the 2020 census was April 1 of 2020. Uh, and so for all of the follow-up operations that happened uh, throughout the summer uh, and early fall, uh, in terms of uh, getting responses from people who hadn't yet participated in the census, we always emphasized that the reference date was April 1. So you were generally supposed to report where you were living on April 1 of 2020. So for instance, if you were living in New York City then, and then because of COVID, you, uh, for instance, uh, moved elsewhere in the country uh, over the next couple of months, uh, you were supposed to report where you were living on April 1. So we, we, and we reminded people of that when we were doing those follow-up operations. Got it. Thank you for clarifying that, Mark. Um, so how does the Bronx rank amongst the largest cities in the country, if you can share? That's a fun question. Uh, I mean, New York City is far and away the largest city in the country. And it's so big that even each of the boroughs within New York would be a very large city if it was just on its own. So, for instance, for the Bronx, which has just a, a shade under 1.5 million people, that would rank it as the seventh largest city in the country uh, in 2020. So it'd be a little bit smaller than Philadelphia, which is number six, but it would actually be uh, bigger than San Antonio. And that's really kind of amazing uh, because when you think about it, the Bronx isn't even uh, one of the biggest boroughs within New York City. 
That is really amazing. Number seven, huh? Um, yep. I hope our viewers are, are you know, surprised about this. I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, so that's that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so the census assured confidence in the quality of the data, yet some are speculating that the Hispanic population was undercounted. And as we know here in the Bronx, uh, the Hispanic population is huge. I think one of the biggest yep. in, in the city. Uh, can you share if this is true? Yeah, it is it is true. Uh, so in 2020, the Hispanic uh, share of the population for the Bronx was uh, about 54.8%, which is up a little bit from what it was in 2010. Um, there, there were, certainly was a lot of focus on uh, the Hispanic or Latino um, participation in the 2020 census. And we don't have all of the data yet um, to sort of say how, uh, how good or bad the count was if there was potentially an undercount. But so far at this point, the count really does align with all of the benchmark data and all of our expectations going into it. So for the US overall, the Hispanic or Latino population was about 62 million. And actually our independently generated estimate of what we thought the Hispanic population would be in 2020 was 61 million. So it was actually a, a, a roughly about a, a million higher than where we thought it was. So just based on that, there does not so far look to have been uh, a Hispanic undercount. But what will, when we'll really know the the answer to that question is next year when we release our what we call our post enumeration survey. This is what we do to measure the accuracy of the census. So we go back and we independently survey a sample of the population to see if they were counted as part of the 2020 census. So that's when we get our estimate of undercount by age, race, uh, sex, and Hispanic origin. And that will be early next year. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, I did read uh, through the census uh, report back and um, some of the news conferences that happened that one population did decrease uh, this year. It was the Black population. Um, was that just in New York City, Mark, or was that a nationwide consensus? Uh, so uh, the the black uh, or African American population it increased nationally, uh, but you know all of the uh, race and ethnic groups you know there's always sort of migration and and sort of um, uh, increase and decreases at the at the city and the neighborhood level across the country. Uh, so there was um, I believe for the Bronx um, a small decrease uh, in the black or African American population, but. Uh, nationally, it, it grew about the same rate as the country overall. And another thing I'm, I'm getting as well from our producer is that uh, we read that there was a nationwide decrease in the white population as well in the census count. Can you um, approve that as well? Yeah, there uh, there was this time and it was it was uh, the first time in a decennial census uh, when the white non-Hispanic population um, actually declined, not just as a share of the population, uh, because it's been doing that for a Many decades now, but in uh, in sheer numeric terms, it was down um, slightly from where it was in 2010. And it's a uh, you know there's there's different things that go into whether a population increases or decreases. Part of it is um, how your births and deaths measure up. If you have more births within a group than deaths, then you'll increase that way. And if you have immigration, you'll increase that way. And the white non-Hispanic population um, is older than the country overall. So it doesn't really gain much um, in terms of uh, uh, births and deaths and, uh, and it doesn't gain much via immigration. Thank you for breaking that down for us, Mark. Um, can you help us define what apportionment is and how it is, the census impacted <clears throat> apportionment? Yes. So apportionment is the process by which we divvy up the U.S. Congress amongst the states. So the Constitution tells us that every state in the country uh, gets at least one seat in the House of Representatives. So the House of Representatives has 435 seats. You give every state one seat, and then you're left with 385 seats remaining. And the Constitution says that those seats should be allocated among the states according to their populations so that bigger states get more seats than smaller state, states. So when we do that, we um, essentially use a, a statistical formula to divvy up those 385 seats across all the states. New York is a very large state, so it got 26 uh, seats overall in this census. 
So some, the smallest states might only get one or two seats. Right, got it, thank you. And we did share a graphic on screen to help our viewers kind of understand that as you went through it. So thank you for that. Great. Um, as we understand, lawmakers are also redrawing maps for districts based on census data through a process called redistricting. Can you explain redistricting and how exactly that works? Yeah, so redistricting is the next step after apportionment. Apportionment tells you how many seats, for instance, New York State is going to have in the next Congress. So it has 26 seats. Redistricting says, okay, take that total population for New York State and then carve it up into districts that are all of the same size uh, across the state. And so we take all of the, the very, very detailed uh, data that came out in this re redistricting release, which goes down to the block level. So that's even smaller than, the, than neighborhoods or census tracts. You think of a city block. So we put out data uh, with the redistricting release uh, for every block in the state of New York and then redistricting, which is a state function, the legislators in New York state will take this data and then carve the state up into uh, 26 congressional districts, each with roughly the same population as each other. Got it, thank you for that. Um, can we emphasize, uh, Mark, the importance of the census count? Now that we have completed the count, we have the results in, um, can you just share how um, you know that, that money, uh, boroughs like the Bronx can receive that money and that support through being counted in this way? Yeah, I mean, the, the census results, you know, first and foremost, the Constitution says you do it for apportionment and redistricting, but we know that the census results are used in numerous, numerous other ways. Uh, they're the basis for um, funding formulas that determine how much money, you know, state and local governments might re receive. They're used by businesses to help understand consumers and to understand, okay, um, this area is growing, so maybe we'll put a new store in this area, or this area has a particular population, maybe it has a lot of uh, young children, so we'll put a, a children's clothing store in this neighborhood. So census data is, is used, I mean, it, it tells us about the American people and uh, what they're like, and that is information that can be used in millions of different ways. Good to know. Um, and it's it's great to emphasize that to the community. I'm glad that you shared that the Bronx did well um, in the census count and we participated very broadly in the community in the city within a city, apparently number yes. seven in the biggest <laughs> US cities. Um, before we go, Mark, can you just share how people can find more information and data about the 2020 census results at this time? I'd be happy to. Our website is census.gov.gov. And from there, uh, you can do all kinds of searches on the different data sets and the 2020 census results. We have a bunch of um, small um, blogs as part of our America Counts series that get into a little bit more detail on each of the topics in the 2020 census. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today, Mark. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Mark Perry is a senior demographer at the Census Bureau. We'll be right back here on Open BXRX Tuesday. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, and they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. And there's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people. It's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality.
Welcome back. Teenage years are naturally full of angst as children move through adolescence to adulthood. The COVID-19 pandemic, remote learning, and back to schooling in person has intensified the stresses of that transition for many of our youth. Joining us now to discuss this and more is Dr. Hina Talib, Adolescent Medicine Specialist at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore. Welcome, doctor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Of course. So to start, doctor, can you please share more about your work with adolescents here in the Bronx? Sure. So I am a pediatrician and an adolescent medicine specialist at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore, where we take care of teenagers, tweens, teens, and young adults. And we take care of everything that a teenager would need, um, whether it be physical health, mental health, wellness, or anything in between. Thank you so much for that, doctor. Um, So as we know, the ongoing stress of fear, grief, and uncertainty created by COVID-19 has weighed on all of us, but many of our children and teens have had an especially tough time coping emotionally. Uh, Can you share what you've seen in your patients this past year? So uh, this is such an important topic. I have seen everything from um, adolescents who have really suffered grief, um, have had chronic stress or, or even trauma um, related to changes in their environment and losses um, secondary to this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I've seen adolescents who um, have thrived and done well, uh, and they have had supports around um, their family, around school, their community. And so it's really quite a range. I will say that those adolescents that have had a harder time are ones that already may have suffered um, from a mental health condition before the pandemic, like anxiety or depression um, or ADHD. And so for those students, we've kept an extra close eye and have been extra in touch with them to try and support them through these, these hard times. Can the pandemic-related stress and traumas have lasting effects on youth? What have you found, doctor, and what have um, uh, specialists found about this? Yeah, so um, it is a heavy load. It is a chronic stress, and you can feel chronic stress both in your body, like your eyes hurt, your head hurts, your stomach hurts, you may feel nauseous, you may be tired, you may be sleeping more or too little, and you can feel it in your emotions um, where you might feel worried, which is normal, um, but you may feel anxious, which um, can become tricky if it's more of the time than not. You may feel sad or low or just over it or fatigued. Um, and, and I've seen sort of all of those reactions play out. And um, you know, the important thing is that what we know from studies on chronic stress uh, in children is that the presence of a supportive adult or adult figure in their lives can really help kind of um, mellow out this chronic stress and, and help going forward. So that having a safe, stable, stable nurturing adult relationship um, is so very important right now to protect our kids from this chronic stress. And to emphasize on that, I know many parents and teachers need help and guidance in, in, you know, noticing what some of those patterns or some of those behaviors are. Uh, Can you share some of the signs and symptoms that parents and teachers can look out for relating to the stress in our teens and adolescents? Yeah, you know, I often get asked, when is it too much or when is it not normal stress anymore? And I think that's a really good question. Um, when you when you feel like the mood changes, the feeling sad or blah or um, not feeling like yourself is lasting longer than two weeks, when you feel like your child is um, not able to complete the tasks that they normally would during a day. So whether that be something related to summer um, summer camp or summer programming like basketball clinic or um, or related to school or a job that they might have had then um, if, it, if it kind of affects their function, their ability to get through their days, that's when I would worry a little bit more about something more serious happening. What does support look like for teens mentally and physically um, as, a, as they prepare back to school? What, what can we do to support our teens? Oh, we have to check in um, because we cannot assume how our adolescents are feeling. Um, and so we really have to check in and listen. Talking is actually listening. And so the more you spend time sort of listening to them, listening to them talk to their siblings, to their cousins, to their other friends, um, listening to them when they try to reach out to you, uh, I think being open and validating any emotion that they have is, um, you know, there's no judgment on an emotion that they might have. So whether they're feeling sad or stressed or angry or frustrated 
or over it, these are all valid. And we should say, yeah, I, I feel you. Like, I get that. That's, that's a lot of people are feeling that way right now. And this is a hard time. And so if you start out by listening and validating, that can go so, so, so very far. So you mentioned one of the things to avoid, doctor, that's judgment, passing judgment on our, our youth and our teens. Mm -hmm. What else should parents and teachers avoid doing during these times, especially, you know, uh, coming from a pandemic and still uh, dealing with a pandemic? Right. So we really want to help support their independence and we want them to feel um, feel strong and feel safe. And so the more we can do to help that happen. So not always talking about COVID-19, not always talking about our own stresses. Of course, it's good to share and be open about our stresses, but we should also at the same time share what we're doing to help our stresses. So whatever our own, you know, whatever's helping us, we should share that at the same time. And I'm going to go for a walk to clear my head. What, what doesn't help so much with adolescents sometimes is if you solve the problem for them or tell them what you need, what they need to do to feel better. Um, it's so much better if you can give them some options or model by yourself doing something or just ask them what would make you feel better uh, and how can how can I help and how can I show up for you in a way that you want uh, really pulling them into the process of um, feeling independent and getting through their days is is so very important these are some really have helpful tips. Thank you for these uh, tips and, and you know, just all this information, doctor, because I know a lot of times, um, you know, parents, uh, they think they know everything about the child and our teens, but they're going through this phase, these changes, and they need our support now more than ever. So thank you for that. Um, so let's talk about preventative care. Um, please tell us about the importance of doctor's visits, especially during these times. I know a lot of folks have not been seeing their doctor out of fear, you know? Yeah, it's that is true. And, you know, I, I we hear you. It, it's a hard time. And the news, we keep getting updates and things do keep changing. Um, however, it's so very important to call your pediatrician to make sure that you are up to date on all of your vaccines. We noticed that there were a lot of routine vaccines that got missed during this year because people, um, many people missed their checkups. And so I would really recommend um, taking the time to reach out to your pediatrician. They may be able to see you in person. They may be able to offer you a virtual visit, but it is important to just reach out, have that check-in, see if you're due for any vaccines, see if you're due for a physical exam. Um, there are so very many things that might get missed. Um, and you know, us pediatricians, we like to sit and have conversations with teenagers to see if there's any which way we might be able to be supportive that may not be so clear at home always. Uh, and so that's important too. And lastly, sports physicals. So, you know, being involved and being active is so very important right now. And I have seen that there have been missed sports physicals. And so um, really recommend calling your pediatrician for a sports checkup to uh, for a clearance before back to school time hits. Thank you for those reminders. Yes, besides the COVID vaccine, you know, our teens need their their routine checkups and their routine vaccines to go back to school. I remember growing up having mm -hmm. to take my little booklet and, you know, check off all the vaccines that I needed to get, including measles, mumps and rubellas and, and all that those other vaccines that we have to get as teens. Um, so we do want to talk about the COVID vaccine, doctor. Um, vaccinating children with the COVID vaccine has been a very sensitive topic for many parents. And as we know, currently only the Pfizer BioNTech COVID vaccine has been authorized for adolescents uh, and teens ages 12 to 17. What are some of the facts with vaccinating teens that, that parents and teachers should know at this time? Mm -hmm. So at this point, more than 10 million adolescents in the 12 to 17 year old age range um, have gotten their first dose and 8 million have gotten both of their doses. This is information from the um, American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC. And this is so, you know, vaccines are actually trending in adolescents, which is, which is wonderful. Uh, vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine is effective and um, provides really good protection against COVID-19 infection. Children, adolescents, they deserve to be protected, just like older adults um, have been offered the vaccine and are being protected. Um, there, they do get sick, and some get sick. When and when some get sick, they get very sick. And um, it is my hope that my patients and my patients' friends and my community um, offers their adolescents this potentially life-saving uh, infection prevent, you know, severe infection preventing vaccine. 
Yes. Um, what have you been um, hearing or what kind of discussions have you been having with parents regarding vaccine hesitancy, doctor? How, how are you engaging with parents about the importance of getting their children vaccinated during these times? I always start with um, what have you heard and what are your questions about the vaccine? I think it, you know, my goal when I'm speaking to a patient, a teenager and their family or their parent is not to necessarily make you get the vaccine that day. That's, you know, my goal is I'm here as a trusted, hopefully trusted um, resource to answer your questions. And, um, and that's my goal is I want to answer your questions. I want to give you my opinion. Um, sometimes there's things that have been like myths or misinformation pieces that are out there. And so I've kind of gotten a little bit used to answering some of those um, with, you know, with good medical evidence uh, where we have it. And I think I think that one on one conversation just really helps more than anything that you can read or see online. Uh, I think, in my opinion, people just want to have that conversation, that like real human conversation with somebody that they know. And um, and I will offer up trusted pediatricians as people to have that conversation with. I think it's important to listen to both the parents questions, but also the teenagers questions themselves. Right. And this is why it's important to check up on our doctors and, and be, be there in, pres in person with our doctors, such as Dr. Talib. Um, mm -hmm. So before we go, doctor, can you just please leave our, our parents and educators with a message on how to best approach the upcoming school year from your perspective and holistically, you know, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally for our, our kids? It's been a roller coaster. We're all really tired. I think approach this year, take deep breaths. Um, and approach this year with a sense of, I would say, hope and optimism always go a long way, but then also be prepared and make plans. Make plans to protect your family from COVID-19. Um, make plans if you were to be infected or if you were to be exposed. So how would you get tested? Um, you know, a little bit of preparation, I think, works against a lot of anxiety. So, um, you know, look for your trusted resources, call your pediatrician, have some plans in place. But let's also be a little bit hopeful and optimistic about our ability to move through this chronic stress by just being there for each other. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Talib, and to your assistant, Teddy Bear, right behind you for joining us today and sharing more about this, you know, important information for our teens with this upcoming school year. You're so Thank welcome. You. Thank you. We'll be right back here on Open BXRX Tuesday. Stay tuned. For you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at Bronxnet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs> Welcome back. 
The Bronx will be getting four new Metro North stations, providing an opportunity that will dramatically increase access to our borough, the city, and the region. Joining us now to discuss these plans and how you can get involved are Sean Breed, Bronx Deputy Director, and Fernando Ortiz, Community Engagement Associate Planner at the New York City Department of City Planning. Welcome. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We're excited to be on. Of course. Yes. So as we shared, um, we have a four new Metro North stations coming to the Bronx. And this is part, um, from my understanding, part of the Penn Station Access Project. Can you tell us more about the project and the four new stations and where they will be located in our borough? Sure, sure. I, I can take that question. And, and thank you again, Sanji. Um, so what is Penn Station Access and what's being proposed here? Uh, this is new Metro North service. So it's being proposed in, in the East Bronx. It's a, a brand new line. Uh, and the MTA calls the project Penn Station Access. It's really a transformative investment uh, that's going to uh, dramatically increase access uh, to the Bronx, to the city, to the region. Uh, the service would run uh, along the existing Amtrak. Uh, it's called the Hellgate Line. That's the Northeast Corridor service uh, that runs into to Boston today, the Amtrak service to Boston. Uh, the service itself would run uh, into uh, Penn Station. So service would go into Penn Station. Uh, and then would connect to the New Haven line to the north uh, and provide new transit connections to Westchester and Connecticut, where, where as you had pointed out, there are none today. Um, and what would that mean for the Bronx? So there would be four new stations uh, starting in the south at Hunts Point, uh, obviously an incredibly important job center, really one of the lifebloods of the city, a strong residential community. The station itself will be located uh, along Hunts Point Avenue east of the Bruckner. Uh, so here really creating safe connections across the Bruckner uh, to the sixth line uh, will be a big challenge here. Uh, you have Park Cheshire Van Ness, uh, almost 70,000 residents live within a half mile of that station uh, today. Um, you have growing immigrant communities and the station itself will be located uh, on the north on the north side of East Tremont Avenue, uh, just east of Union Port uh, and White Plains Road. Uh, today here, East Tremont Avenue is really uh, served as a backdoor uh, for both of these communities. So re-envisioning this as a, a pedestrian friendly uh, transit corridor uh, that connects both of these neighborhoods, Park Chester and Van Ness will be really important. Uh, Morris Park will be the next station, uh, largest job center in the Bronx. You have healthcare and life science jobs. Uh, the station itself will be located along Morris Park Avenue uh, where it runs into the rail tracks just east of East Chester Road. Uh, and really creating a neighborhood center here, a seamless pedestrian connection over the rail line to support this job center will be important. And then Co-op City, uh, the largest co-op in the world, 50,000 residents live there. Uh, the station itself uh, will be located near Section 5. It's a little limited because of the rail line. We have to work within the existing rail line. Uh, so really connecting the station itself uh, for bus, for bikes, for peds uh, into the heart of Co-op City and the surrounding neighborhood. So access will be uh, the key here. Um, and as we mentioned, when will this happen? Uh, earlier this year, the MTA received approval from the federal government to move forward with their environmental review. Uh, and, and really what this means and what it allowed the MTA to do is release a schedule uh, where construction would begin on the, on, the, on the line next year and it would open in 2025. Right. Thank you so much for that, um, Sean. And, uh, you know, apparently this is a huge game changer uh, for Bronx sites and for people community in, in and out of the borough. Um, how has the city engaged with the Bronx community throughout this planning stage? Sure. And I, I can talk a little bit about, you know, the importance of the of the service itself. And then uh, maybe Fernando can talk a little bit about some of the, the outreach we've been doing before COVID uh, and, of course, after COVID. Um, getting new rail service in itself, the, the stations uh, will actually, uh, you have a third of the Bronx, almost 500,000 residents live within a mile of these stations. So the effect of uh, the new service is incredible. Uh, it would reduce commute times by uh, into Midtown by up to almost two thirds uh, and create uh, new transit service to this, uh, in, in itself uh, to the north that doesn't exist today. Uh, for example, if you, if you lived in Co-op City, um, a commute in the Midtown today might take uh, upwards of an hour, um, and this would reduce commute times uh, up to 25 to 30 minutes to get into Midtown with the new service. And it would provide brand new service, which doesn't exist today, uh, into Westchester and Connecticut, uh, where really driving is, is the only option that you have. And so I don't know, Fernando, if you want to talk a little bit about 
uh, how we've been engaging with engaging with the community uh, in, in the study itself? Yes, yeah, so um, the project team prior to COVID um, conducted multiple in-person public meetings at each of the proposed station areas to receive input and work with the community to develop a vision for the station areas. Um, this feedback helped shape draft recommendations and began to develop a community vision for the station areas. Um, and then of course COVID happened and we had to figure out a way to continue the conversation with the community remotely and provide as many opportunities to provide input as possible while being sensitive to the current situation and the community's needs. So in May, uh, the Department of City Planning launched the Bronx Metro North Remote Open House for the Morris Park and Park Chester Van Ness stations. Um, this site provides an opportunity to read through these draft recommendations interact through with graphics, um, watch videos, and provide feedback as well as an interactive survey. The site and the survey are still open and we encourage all community stakeholders to participate, whether you live, work, learn, play, pray, or grew up in one of these areas. Um, and in June, we held two remote workshops or live Zoom sessions, um, one for Park, one for Chester and Ness, where residents and other stakeholders could sign up and have a discussion with each other about their priorities and vision. Um, the session, in, you know, used interactive tools to capture live feedback, and there was Spanish translation available as well. Um, currently, um, anyone can sign up for our office, or for our open office hours, and schedule some time to work uh, to speak to us one on one. Um, and there is Spanish available as well. Um, we expect to launch a similar site for uh, Hunts Point and Co-op City this fall. And we have been using social media, uh, Instagram, Twitter, eBlast um, from us and from our partners to help promote all of this. Um, and it's important for us that our community partners help us promote this as well. Yeah. Um, and our team is always available to attend local events to discuss and is open to other ideas. And again, we encourage anyone and everyone to take our online survey. Thank you so much for that, Fernando. It's uh, community engagement and accessibility, language accessibility is so important in our community, especially when it comes to a huge project like this. So thank you for sharing. Um, how has COVID-19 affected planning for these stations? I would say that COVID uh, changed everything, of course, um, but we needed to understand how it changed the priorities for this project, um, especially in the Bronx where its effects were disproportionate and in many ways um, a light was shown on existing inequities within our borough. Um, the need for safe and accessible open space, good transit and access to things like healthcare and jobs were always priorities, but became even more important. And it was clear for this project that um, you know, this kind of this kind of project um, and the expansion of the Metro North into the East Bronx could be important to the rec to recovery by providing each of those things, you know, that I mentioned, you know, growing and creating new jobs, housing, um, increasing access to transit and open spaces. Um, I would also say that COVID emphasized the large amount of essential workers in the Bronx and how important a project of this magnitude could be for essential workers and helping improve their commutes. Um, for DCP, it was important to continue the conversation with the community to make sure that the planning work kept up with the MTA project. Um, and while a remote setting cannot replace in-person outreach, um, we know um, that we had to offer multiple opportunities for feedback to reach as many people as possible. So we had to get a little creative. Um, also the remote open house allows for opportunities for the community to engage in the planning process um, at their own pace and at their own time and creates more opportunities for participation. Thank you for sharing. Um, so Bronx residents have brought up concerns about parking, street safety and gentrification at two recent Department of City Planning Bronx Metro North workshops. How is the DCP seeking to address these concerns when it comes to these stations? Sure, sure, I can, I can take that Sanji. And yeah, I just wanna start by saying that, uh, you know, this is really the time uh, to voice and, and discuss those concerns. That's why we're, we're doing the planning work now. Um, not only understand how existing residents can get the most out of this new rail service, but but to address concerns just like that. And so uh, what about parking? Um, the MTA is, is, is not providing parking at the stations themselves. They don't uh, at any of their, their New York City stations. I always use the example of Fordham, uh, one of the busiest stations in the system. It functions very well um, and, and doesn't have parking. 
one of our goals is also to make sure that the stations themselves are, are connected to the existing mass transit, safely accessible by, by pedestrians, by bike, um, and really making it easier uh, to not have to drive, to be able to use transit. But we know that's not always an option. Um, and so any new development, of course, would have parking requirements. Uh, and we're using this study to really understand what uh, communities' needs are uh, for things like parking. In, in, the, in the Park Chester Van Ness neighborhood itself, uh, we heard some very specific concerns around that station area. Um, I think some of these were about uh, existing lots. Some of those are Park Chester's garages that are on, on Tremont Avenue. Uh, some of the lots on the north side of uh, Tremont Avenue that are used for parking today. Um, and there are no plans to remove any of that parking. In fact, um, you know, we want to work with the existing owners. We want to work with the community to understand how we can uh, support uh, and improve some of those existing lots. Um, and I think the second question was regarding uh, concerns about gentrification or, or really if the new service will uh, displace uh, existing residents or cause rents to rise. You know, this is this is a real concern um, that we've heard. We know we know it's out there. Uh, and we know that there are many different types of housing uh, along the line from the Park Chester and Co-op City developments themselves to smaller homeowners to renters. Uh, and we're using this time to really understand uh, what the needs are so that we can provide uh, the right resources to those residents. And we're working closely with city agencies, with community partners uh, to understand those needs uh, and to make sure we're providing support. I think of um, you know, the Park Chester, we know, has a very large senior population. What are their specific needs? Um, things like that uh, is just an example. Also, this is an area that hasn't really seen uh, any new significant new housing growth. Yeah. Um, and we want to understand where new affordable housing can meet community needs, too. And new affordable housing can really take some of the pressure off uh, and provide opportunities for existing residents. And so I would say now, again, is, is when we want to hear these concerns and yeah. um, we're working to address them as part of the study. Thank you so much for that, um, Sean. So I, we're running out of time, but I just wanted to share with the viewers how they can find more information on the plan and also submit questions and comments or concerns uh, towards uh, the plan as well. Can you please share and also share the anticipated opening date? Sure, sure. Um, again, the actual service itself uh, is anticipated now to open in 2025. Uh, so that's why it's so important to plan now. Um, we want to continue doing our community outreach and, and hopefully release a draft uh, plan uh, at the end of the year. This is not an endpoint. It's just a draft plan. Uh, it will be an opportunity to get additional input, uh, input on that and really start thinking about uh, implementation. So that, that's our uh, real next steps to go out in the fall uh, and have uh, additional outreach uh, around uh, both uh, Co-op City and Hunts Point uh, and then release a draft plan later this year. Thank you so much for that. And in order to find out more information and submit more information and questions, you can visit nyc.gov slash BMNS. That information is on the bottom of the screen. You can also reach out to the Department of City Planning at BMNS at planning.nyc.gov or call 718-220-8500. Sean Fernando, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing more about this uh, Bronx Metro North stations coming soon to our borough. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're taking a quick break here on Open BXRX Tuesday. We'll be right back. We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at Bronxnet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs>
Welcome back. Local community organizations have been essential by providing support, services, and more throughout the pandemic. We Stay Nos Quedamos is one of those community organizations here in the Bronx, and they're seeking to keep connected with the community through an open house centered on healing in a community garden. Joining us now to share more is Carmen De Jesus, community organizer at We Stay Nos Quedamos. Welcome, Carmen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Of course. So for those who are not familiar, can you tell us about We Stay Nos Quedamos and your mission? Yeah, gladly. So We Stay Nos Quedamos is a nonprofit organization who is and has always been dedicated to community resiliency and self-determination in the South Bronx through community ownership. We also provide social services to help people um, obtain housing for Housing Connect. And we also have community engagement projects focused on resiliency, civic engagement, youth leadership development, and that's just to name a few. Thank you so much for that, Carmen. And I know that We Stay Nos Quedamos has been here for the community throughout this tumultuous year, throughout the pandemic. Can you share how um, the organization has helped support the Melrose community through uh, COVID-19? Yeah, sure. So I think the biggest thing when the pandemic hit was we did a survey in one of our buildings just to get a feel of what were some of the issues that they felt were most prevalent. And the biggest thing that came about was food insecurity. So from there, we started doing hot meals and then we transitioned to doing food distribution, which we now have once a week, every Wednesday. Um, can you also share more about your role as a community organizer and what that entails? So as a community organizer, my biggest role is really just establishing and maintaining relationships within the community. So in terms of those community engagement projects that I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest things would be connecting the community to those different opportunities. Right. And one of those uh, ways that you're doing that is through an open house that's coming up. Can you share more about your first session, We Stay Nos Quedamos to Heal? Yes. So the whole reason why we have this first session is really two reasons. The first is so that the community can get to know who We Stay Nos Quedamos is and what we stand for and the work that we've been doing in the South Bronx as well as just creating a space for the community to come together, right? COVID-19 was no joke. It amplified a lot of issues. And even till now, we're still struggling. We still are dealing with COVID. So it's really a space for the community to come together as well and work on healing, feeling those feelings together and moving forward. And we shared that flyer on screen. It'll be taking place on Thursday, August 27th, between 5 to 7 at Brook Park Garden. Correct, Carmen? August 26, but everything else August is kind of got you. Um, so what should participants be prepared to learn and do during these open house sessions? I think the biggest thing is really just being ready to learn, listen, and to receive. We want participants coming in to have an open mind and learning who Nos Quedamos is, not just as an organization, but also as members of the community. Also being able to listen to other stories of those that have been amplified due to COVID and the different struggles that other community members are going through. And also receiving that feeling of togetherness as a community and coming together as one. And in saying that, why was it important to center healing in this first open house and of course host it at a community garden? I think the main reason why we decided on healing first is because in a community like ours, right, we have all these different struggles going on and our main mode is just survival. But with that, you know, sometimes we need to take a step back and really feel those feelings of sadness, anger, frustration, and focus on healing because we can't move forward unless we acknowledge how we're feeling in the moment. And I think that ties into the reason why we picked a community garden. When you're in nature, you feel more free and more vulnerable. And it's definitely more of a grounding experience when dealing with heavy emotions like that. Right. And let's get into what some of those meditations can look like for people. You know, often, like you said, we don't have time to heal. Um, there's so many essential workers in the community, so many people, uh, you know, just trying to just get by during this past year. Um, what are some of those grounding, uh, you know, healing ex uh, experiences that people can expect to, to witness here at, at the open house? Yeah. So I think it's not going to be anything super intense just because, you know, I'll say myself, I'm not an expert in leading those really intensive healing exercises, but it's really going to be more focused on like deep breathing, right? When you're in survival mode, sometimes it feels like you're holding your breath and you're not really in the moment within yourself. So a lot of those, that healing component is really going to be focused on breathing, you know, in and out very slowly, and even some light stretches because sometimes the stress is held within your body physically. 
Right. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. I also know that um, we stay nos quedamos. Um, of course, we partnered through BronxNet uh, for the People's Candidate Forum and so many other civic engagement um, events and mm -hmm. programs. Can you share more about the importance of keeping the community connected through civic engagement as well with an upcoming election in November? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing a lot is civic engagement is really always portrayed as like, oh, you just have to vote, you just have to vote. But I think it loses the focus of why it matters to vote, right? The reason why you're making sure your vote is counted and your voice is heard is because there were issues that you want to see changes to. And the community is the one that really holds the power in making sure that that's really seen through for our elected officials. Right. Um, uh, an event that I kind of want to highlight that I had, you know, the pleasure and honor of working with together with Nos Quedamos um, was the one at Yolanda Garcia Park. And um, when it came to rank choice voting, what were some of the things that you were hearing from the community in Melrose about just, you know, election season in general and just that engagement that they received during that that event? I think a lot of the feedback that we really got was the community feeling like their voice didn't matter. It didn't matter if they went out and actually voted because at the end of the day, none of the issues that they voiced was ever going to be handled or dealt with or a really community first kind of perspective. And I think that's why we had that event. It was really to change the narrative and to really empower folks like, look, that's not how it should be. That may have been how it has been, but that's not where it should be. The whole focus is that the community is the one in power and we need our voices heard. And that's just the end of that. Agreed. And going back to the open house event, what do you hope that the community takes away the most from attending these events? I know there are three sessions, right, Carmen? Yes. As of right now, we do have three sessions with the hope that there's going to be more. And I think the biggest takeaway is just coming together as a community. COVID has really... If anything, besides amplifying all the other issues that our community faces, I think it has kind of brought people apart in a sense, right? We were stuck in lockdown, not really seeing anyone. So I think the biggest thing is just feeling that togetherness because the South Bronx has gone through a lot and it's still going through a lot. And the only way we can really overcome those challenges is being together as one. Currently, do you have any events or, you know, support or any type of um, resources that you can share with the community? I know that you have a, a food distribution event as well every Wednesday morning, I believe it is. Can you share yes, that? that event, however, is only for one specific building. So I wouldn't necessarily say that that is open for the whole community. But again, those community engagement opportunities that we have are different ways that the community can actually get involved in areas of like youth leadership, resiliency or civic engagement like we just talked about. Right. I want to learn more about how you got started in Nos Quedamos, Carmen. Um, how did you start in community organizing? How did you, you know, receive this position? <laughs> um, what has Nos Quedamos taught you as a Bronxite? I think it's kind of funny because I never pictured myself as a community organizer. Like I always knew that I had this love for nonprofit and really being a part of the change in my community. But my understanding was in order to do that, I had to be at like United Nations, that higher level type of government area. And so when I got into NQ, it was through an internship through SYEP. And the first day they were like, what do you want to get out of it? And I was like, I want to learn more about nonprofits, especially this one. And ever since then, they were throwing me into different works and projects that they were doing. They would have me attend different meetings to learn more about um, their mission and vision. And it was really inspiring. And then through keeping contact, they offered me this position, which I've really been learning that if you want to make a change in your community, you don't have to wait for those outside resources to come in, but you can actually be a part of the change, especially as a youth, you know, a lot of it, that mentality is like, get out, go somewhere else. You kind of just leave your community, but you can make your community the way you see fit. I hear that. And I can definitely say the same about the opportunity I've gotten at BronxNet and, and as well as Nos Quedamos. Um, the work that we've been doing together has been incredible and really um, inspiring for a lot of Bronxites and myself as well. Mm -hmm. There's so much power that we have. And I think that, you know, unlocking that comes in, you know, events like this, like an open house that can teach you what that power can look like and how we can manifest it together. So mm -hmm. without further ado, how can people learn more about NQ? Um, any websites, any social media pages? 
Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. So I would say the biggest way to learn more about NQ is checking out our website, www.nosquedamos.org. And there you can actually subscribe to our newsletter where you'll be kept in the loop about events that we're hosting, different projects that you can be a part of, and much more. And Carmen, of course, please invite our viewers to attend NQ's open house, the first session taking place very soon. Yes, I would love to see so many faces join us for our open house again, which is Thursday, August 26 at 5 p.m. at Friends of Brook Park Garden. And that's at 494 East 141st Street here in the Bronx. Um, I'll be there. So I hope to see everyone there and, you know, connect and heal with the community at a beautiful community garden in our neighborhood. Um, before we go, Carmen, just a message for the community on, you know, how nonprofits and orgs such as Nos Quedamos continue to be here for us and, you know, what we can do moving forward to just foster that relationship together. I think the biggest thing is knowing that even though we are a nonprofit, we're still members of the community, just like yourselves. We're no different. And I think together, it's really how we can be a part of that change that we want to see. Yes. Thank you, Carmen, for your time today and for sharing more about NQ's Open House. Thank you so much. Of course. Carmen de Jesus is the community organizer at We Stay Nos Quedamos. Again, you can join Carmen and Nos Quedamos at their We Stay Nos Quedamos to Heal event taking place on Thursday, August 26th at 5 p.m. at Brook Park Garden. So that's all for our show today. I'm your host, Santi Lopez, wishing you and your safety and wellness now and always. See you next time here on Open Your Hearts.